These two images represent great achievements in science. On one side, the foundation of Alzheimer's research in the West for the past 20 years. On the other, the pioneering stem cell research of South Korea's most famous researcher. But they also just so happen to be the images that brought them down, because they have both been faked. In fact, some experts estimate that between 5 and 10% of research could be fake. From rigging experiments and straight up making up data, to researchers reviewing their own papers, submitting AI generated ones, and there are many many ways of manipulating images. By the end of this video, you'll understand not only what makes these sort of images fake, you'll know more than you ever knew you wanted about dubious scientists, as well as what we can do about it. Because I'm gonna teach you not only how scientists cheat, but also how professional image detectives spot it, and how you can too. I want to start us out by just getting a feel for what image manipulation can look like in research with this paper, or more specifically, this image of particles that I can tell you have been photoshopped by the authors. I'll give you a few seconds to see if you can spot what's wrong, and no worries if you can't, as I'll teach you more thoroughly how to later on in the video. Once you spot it though, it's hard to unsee. This image is filled with the same 5 duplicated particles, copy pasted all over the place. Normally, this should have been caught in the peer review process. That's where the scientific journal sends out your paper to other researchers, to have them review it, issue corrections, and generally give feedback on your paper. But clearly, they didn't look close enough. Which is gonna be a recurring theme in this video. Of course, scientists have been faking images and data long before Photoshop existed. According to the history books, the first ever person to commit scientific fraud may have been the ancient Greek astronomer Claudius Ptolemy. He's well known for popularizing the geocentric model of the universe, with Earth at the center and planets, stars and moons revolving around it. But the observations that led him to this discovery have faced a lot of scrutiny. As described in Robert R. Newton's 1977 book, The Crime of Ptolemy, he had made many weird observational errors, which led Robert to conclude that all of his theories depend heavily on fabricated data, and some of them depend completely upon such data. At least Robert thinks so, and he really didn't like Ptolemy. Just look at some of these quotes. Modern interpretations are generally more favorable to Ptolemy, although scholars do disagree on the severity of his mistakes. But how did we go from that to between 5 and 10% of research being faked? You may have seen Derek's popular video titled, Is Most Published Research Wrong? In it, he lays out that. Nearly a third of published results will be wrong even with the system working normally. Perhaps even the majority, according to some research. Although I guess that might also be wrong. But wrong is not equal to misconduct, of which the US National Science Foundation defines three types. Fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. Basically making up results, altering them, and stealing things. So when I say faked, I'm referring to these types of misconduct. In 2016, microbiology researcher Elizabeth Bick published an analysis of just over 20,000 papers she had scanned by eye for image manipulations. The results? Just about 800 contained problematic images. That's 4%, but she estimates that only around half were done on purpose, placing the rate of misconduct at 2%. So why did I say that 5-10% to contain misconduct? Well, it's because Bick only looked at images. You can also fake data, tables, and protocols, plagiarize written work, misrepresent citations, omit conflicts of interest, and use chat GPT. If you spent some time with it yourself, you might have run into this sentence. You should, however, never find it in published peer-reviewed research. And yet, several papers have recently gained attention for including these clearly generated sentences. As I said, we're gonna see a lot of things that shouldn't have made it through peer review in this video. But anyhow, adding up this and the many other types of fakery lands us at a total estimate of 5-10% to misconduct, at least according to some experts. It's not something we have a super accurate estimate on, as most investigations, besides pics, have just been simple surveys, which are rarely that precise. Regardless, images make up a significant percentage of misconduct, and we'll be using a slightly modified version of Bix's classification system to understand them. It consists of three groups, clones, which are identical duplicated images, overlaps, which share a part of the same image, and alterations that require photoshopping of images in various ways. We'll label them as type 1, 2, and 3 manipulations. They increase in both complexity and the level of misconduct as you move up the types. To understand why, let's have a look at some. We'll start with this close-up of human tissue and bring in a copy to make it a type 1, as they're identical. 
It turns into a type 2 by adding this one. It's clearly not a clone, but if I overlay it on top of the first, you'll see that it has some overlap, hence the name. Overlaps can be partial like this one. They can also be internal, as well as stretched and mirrored. It's much easier to see with something like a photo of a person, because our brains are much better evolved to detect those shapes, rather than the patterns we usually find in research. But research images are also often more repetitive, unintuitive, and they can play tricks on your brain. These two images are identical, and yet it'll look to most of you like the shape in this one is curving outwards, and this one inwards. But look what happens if I turn this one upside down. For some of you, I'll also need to cover it. Now you can see they're identical. Flip this one, and they're the opposite of where we started. This effect is known as light and shadow ambiguity. And in this paper, you'll find this along with more examples. But that's enough of a tangent. Next, I'll show you some real examples of type 1 and 2 manipulations. We'll save type 3 for later. You can either sit back, relax and enjoy the show, or pause to find the manipulations yourself. Either way, you'll learn how to do it. This is a published paper with a type 1 clone. See if you can find it. You should know that images will still count as type 1, even if there's some brightness and contrast differences. In this case though, they're identical. These two papers are completely unrelated, and yet, in figure 2 and 3, we find some of the exact same images. The second paper simply stole it, and without automated plagiarism detection for images, this could easily be published, which it was. Let's do one more type 1. This time the brightness and contrast is not matched. And for some reason I had to stare at it for like 30 seconds before I saw it. And it's easy to forget how difficult it can be to find these, once you know where to look. Moving on to type 2 manipulations, let's identify some fakery by finding an overlap in these panels. It's usually easiest to identify a feature in one panel and then look for it in the others. Like these black dots that form a triangle. Searching the remaining panels should yield a match. In fact, in this case too, as all these three panels overlap. By the way, this paper has been referenced nearly 200 times. And despite the overlaps being reported in 2021, the journal still hasn't retracted it. Overlaps can be quite difficult to spot, like in this example, where only small parts of the images overlap. Luckily, image detection tools like ImageTwin can do the work for us, automatically detecting even the smallest of overlaps. Tools like these are an easy way for journals to avoid publishing this type of misconduct, but most have been pretty bad at using them, which has resulted in a lot of these examples. But scientists have found way sneakier ways of cheating that are much more difficult to spot. To understand how, follow along with me to 123me.ru, a Russian website where anyone can buy authorships on real research papers. They have an archive going back to 2018, covering all their publications, along with information on exactly how much everyone paid for their authorship, but only so much as to keep the researchers anonymous and the articles unknown. Or oh, that was at least the idea, because researcher Anna Abelkina has supposedly identified over 300 of these papers. She has also found that Russian governors who plagiarized their PhD thesis, and yes, there are that many, are significantly worse at governing. Fascinating research. The malpractice behind 123me.ru is known as a paper mill. And I have a whole video dedicated to the ones that produce fake papers. 123me is in the real spectrum and is called an author mill. Let me also give you an example of a paper from a translation mill. In this case, an old Russian paper that was secretly translated to English, given new authors and republished. And we're not just talking a couple of papers, as a total of 259 translation mill papers from Russia alone were found in this 2020 analysis. These type of mills are often concentrated in Russia and China, but it's not rare to find the names of Western scientists on author mill papers. After all, paper mills have been pretty good at cheating Western journals into accepting their papers. But sometimes, it's the journals that cheat. There are whole scientific journals that exist solely to scam you, scientists, out of your money. They're called predatory journals, and they look, feel, and operate exactly like a regular journal. Except all many of them do is store your paper on an online server for an extravagant fee. No peer review, in fact no fact checks at all. They have no credibility and therefore no one will trust or probably even see your paper. In 2015, the psychology journal Ludus Vitali forgot to renew their web domain, so a predatory journal did it for them, and then proceeded to build a website that looked exactly like Vitali's, and began accepting papers for $150. 
This is known as journal hijacking. And once a journal's official web domain has been taken, there's actually very little they can do to get it back. The publisher Euromed Communications lost sales simply because they forgot to pay a $10 bill. The journal archives the sciences didn't have a website, so in 2012 hijackers made one pretending to be them and began accepting payments for various services. Archives the sciences only found this out once they started receiving complaints that they hadn't delivered on the services they promised. In 2004, Kobe Noland received his master's degree in business administration from Trinity Southern University, which is great, oh, except for the small detail that Kobe was a house cat. In fact, there are currently at least six cats, eight dogs, and one goldfish with human credentials, detailed on the appropriately named Wikipedia page. Kobe specifically was owned by the Deputy Attorney General of Pennsylvania and got his degree as part of a sting operation to expose Trinity for selling illegitimate degrees, a diploma mill. And if you're handing them out to cats, you probably fit that description pretty well. The lawsuit that followed resulted in significant fees and the eventual shutdown of the operation, all thanks to a very highly educated cat. These are just some of the ways malpractice happen, and I'll cover more later on once you've helped me expose Huang. He's arguably South Korea's most famous and perhaps infamous researcher. Huang got there by achieving the first cloning of a dog, then cloning cows and tigers, and finally the holy grail, human embryos. But later investigations revealed that everything except the dog had been faked. The panels from the intro are from his embryo clonings, and they're actually part of a larger figure that contains two clones and three overlaps. He really outdid himself with this one. It'll be in the description if you want to find all of them. But we'll just focus on the easiest overlap. Fun fact, to create images like these, Huang illegally obtained over 2,000 human eggs, including from women in his own lab who felt pressured to donate. One in five of those women reported side effects, which usually includes weight gain and mood changes, but also potentially injury to the bowel, blood clots, and kidney failure, if you are very unlucky. Well, did you spot it? A clear overlap between these panels. There are many more manipulations and unethical behavior I could go into, but instead I'll just refer you to the amazing two-part documentary that Bobby put together about the scandal. It'll be linked below. Despite the severity of his misconduct, Wong only had a couple of papers retracted. But who is at the most? The website Retraction Watch keeps a leaderboard with the top five contenders, each having had three digits worth of papers retracted. The numbers are not entirely up to date, but it still gives a good indication of just how many papers a single researcher can fake. The top three spots are occupied exclusively by anesthesiologists, and you can hear about Fuji's story in my paper mill video. More importantly, Retraction Watch also has a database cataloging over 50,000 retracted papers, and it's a great resource for checking if any researchers you're referencing are problematic. Another website you should know about is Puppia. Most documentation of problems with papers start with a post on here, made by other researchers or really anyone, which could include you who have noticed issues with a paper. Manipulations take all sorts of forms, and to introduce to have free alterations, I want us to have a look at my absolute favorite video on the subject. It's this one from 60 Symbols, where Brady and Professor Moriarty take a closer look at a paper about nano chopsticks. So, what are, what are we looking at? We're looking at a transmission electron microscope image of gold nano rods. And for me, sort of when I look at that image, I go, wow, that's, that's mad. Why would you get these very well-defined angles? And then you zoom in. All right, do you see anything suspicious there? Brady? <laughs> I mean, I'm not brilliant at Photoshop. No worries, Brady, neither were the authors. In contrast to Type 2 manipulations, where mainly various parts of images are highlighted, Type 3 requires actual image manipulation, Photoshopping of images. And you clearly don't have to do a very good job at it. But no need to be alarmed, this has surely been published in some obscure, unknown journal. This is not some very poor quality journal at the bottom. This is one of the top, you know, the top ranking journals in the field. He is right. This was published in Nano Letters, which, by the way, is not just a top ranking journal in nanotechnology. It's literally in the top 1% of journals overall, leading us to the natural question. How the hell did that get through peer review? Well spoken, Moriarty. This will become clearer if we actually take a look at the paper. The first images are in the abstract on page 1, but we can't really see much because of how small they are. 
Page 2 has none. On page 3 though, we find some larger ones. But when looking closely at them, they seem pretty convincing. I mean, there's no obvious cutouts like the ones 60 Simple showed us. So let's continue. And well, there's actually no more images in the paper. So what's going on? Well, it turns out that most of the obvious photoshopping is blurred out on printed paper. The difference is very stark when comparing directly to the digital copy. To be clear, I don't know for sure if this was how the peer reviewers were fooled, but it's the most realistic explanation I could come up with. So peer reviewers be aware that you probably need to look at the digital version of a paper. Although I do have to say that it's not often something as obvious as this slips through peer review at top journals. So if you want to ensure your sham papers get published, you'll have to be a bit more clever. Like plant compound researcher Hyung In Moon, who found an interesting way of ensuring his papers would make it through peer review. See, some journals will allow you to suggest which researchers should review your paper. This is because you likely already know which researchers in your field are best suited for the job. And for the journal, they can save some money by not spending time selecting them. But Moon never had the intention of selecting appropriate researchers. In fact, he didn't select any at all. Besides himself, that is because he just made up a bunch of names and email addresses and suggested that they do the reviewing, and it worked. He got over 30 papers for peer review using this loophole, placing him at rank 17 on Research Watch. Eventually though, he did get caught, but only because he would return the reviews within 24 hours of receiving the papers, which looks a little suspicious when that process usually takes weeks to complete. But fret not, because you don't have to invent fake people when you can just use your friends. Last year, the publisher Plus One retracted over 100 papers due to compromise peer review. It turned out a group of authors had been working together to get each other's papers published. 41 people were involved in at least 10 papers and probably formed the inner core of the misconduct. And it's not exactly rare to see something like this, as Retraction Watch database returns just over 5,000 results for papers retracted due to fake peer review. It's also important to highlight that it wasn't only the authors that were involved, but also journal editors. They not only select which papers get a chance to be published, but also manage the whole peer review process. And corrupt editors typically don't care as much about the specific papers they publish as they do this index. At the bottom of every paper is a list of references. Each paper on here gains one point, a citation, every time it's referenced. Some papers get very popular, gathering thousands of citations, but the average across all papers published by a journal is much lower. This number is known as the impact factor. By the way, this is not a realistic one. The journal with the largest is a cancer journal for clinicians at 254.7. But perhaps surprisingly, the average impact factor is only around two. And since its introduction in the 1970s, it's grown to become the single most important number for journals, basically equivalent to quality, which has meant that some are willing to manipulate it. Impact factor is owned and distributed by the company Clarivate, and every year, they suspend the impact factor of several journals due to purposeful manipulation, mainly in the form of editors from multiple journals working together by forcing papers they publish to disproportionately cite each other's journals, driving up their impact factor. Known as the citation cartel, this is just one of the many ways citations are manipulated. And quick rant, it seems really weird to me that the body in charge of assigning the arguably most important factor for journals is a company and not a non-profit science organization. Clarivate could easily make underhand deals with journals in exchange for not suspending them, as well as much more corrupt stuff. And did you know that 20 to 30% of a university's ranking is determined just by citations? The Times Higher Rankings, which is among the most popular, has citations at 30%. Research and teaching reputation is only about half as important as citations, and everything else much less. The Hirsch or simply H index is widely used to rank researchers and just so happen to be based on publications and he guessed it, citations. This one metric has become embedded in scientific publishing from journals to institutions to researchers. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be used at all, but just like YouTube views don't equate to quality, neither should citations. Okay, rand over. Now let's get a grip on type three alterations with what I'll call the four actions. There's to duplicate, combine, remove, and generate. Type 3 images will often employ a combination of these. The nano chopstick and middle particle images both utilize duplication, but only one was done with proper blending, an important property that basically means to have smooth transitions between layers or areas. 
It's actually really well done with the metal particles, but the sheer number of duplications give it away. The combine action adds together multiple features. You can see it in this image. It has three regular duplications, but also this one, with the same features combined with two different blots. If you do a good job at blending them and avoid duplications, it can be next to impossible to spot. And to show you just how easy it is, let's do it. To duplicate something in Photoshop, I'll select any of these tools to cut out a shape around a feature. I then paste it on a new layer and move it to another position. To make it look not like the nano ruts, I'll do one click with the background eraser tool at an appropriate tolerance. And you're on your way to creating something like the middle particles. Earlier, I used this image to illustrate type 1 and 2 manipulations, but there was just one problem, this annoying arrow that disrupted the image. Luckily, removing it is easy once you learn to generate. If I highlight an area outside the boundary of the image and use Generate Fill, Photoshop will generate a whole new area. Completely fake, but nevertheless looks like it could be real. This can be used to remove features as well, like the arrow. I'll simply highlight the area around it, then Generate Fill, and voila, the arrow's gone. No skill required. Here's an example from real research. The image to the right is supposed to illustrate how a laser treatment got rid of face pigmentation. But if you look close enough, you'll see that they're actually the same image, just with some of the pigments digitally removed. Again, it's almost too easy with Photoshop. Don't like this plot? Three seconds and it's gone. These dots? Only one highlight each required. Wanna get rid of your annoying stepdad? Boom, it's done. Now, it isn't always this easy, especially the last one, but that's essentially it. Four actions that can be learned relatively quickly, and it'll be important in exposing the manipulated research behind Alzheimer's. The disease that erodes away your memory and stands as the seventh leading cause of death in the US as of 2021. The main theory has been that a protein called amyloid beta builds up in the brain, kind of like the plague in our arteries that cause cardiovascular disease. Amyloid is different in substance, but the adverse effects are just as significant. At least that's what some very influential research from the 2000s would have us believe. But in retrospect, it was probably faked. Contrary to the case of Wang, many scientists are involved, two of the most influential, Sylvian Lesney and Mark Tessier Levine. The extent of Levine's misconduct spans three different labs where he was in charge. From type 2 overlaps to type 3 combinations and Frankenstein plots put together by overlapping individual chunks of many images. But it's Lesney's research that's behind the fake image from the intro. Let's see if you can find it with your knowledge of type 3 alterations. The image is from a paper he published in Nature in 2006, and since then, it has accumulated over 2,000 citations. It's also not the only paper of his people are questioning, as there's at least 20 papers he has published that contain suspicious images. Time's up, did you spot it? There's a duplication of the two lines here, with four to six plots being the exact same. It's simple, but was somehow not discovered for almost 20 years. Unlike with Wang's fake stem cells, the manipulated Alzheimer's research hasn't completely invalidated what they were trying to prove, as the amyloid beta theory is definitely not seen as disproven now. This makes sense with some background, as amyloid beta plaques were discovered in the brain in 1906, and research from the 80s resulted in the amyloid beta hypothesis really taking hold, so it's not without real evidence. Although it has definitely resulted in research into Alzheimer's being too narrowly focused on amyloid, as it's quite clear today that we need other theories to fully explain the pathology of how Alzheimer's develops in the human brain. There are not many things that literally every country in the world can agree on, but one of the few is that fraud is illegal. However, take a wild guess as to in how many research fraud and misconduct is illegal. It's zero one, kind of, I'll explain. As far as I can tell, in the West, these five researchers are the only people to ever face jail time from faking research. But out of them, four got their sentence specifically because they had misused government grant money, which makes it look more like regular fraud cases. Only Stephen Eaton of Britain got jail time exclusively for the potential danger his falsified research imposed. In his case, tampering with the data for an anti-cancer drug to make it seem successful. That if it had gone to clinical trials, could have harmed real cancer patients. And his punishment? Three months in jail, the least of the bunch. Importantly, Eaton was working at the pharmaceutical company up to it when he did the research. 
and it's unclear if the more common grant money charge would have been applied instead had he been working at a university like the others. The merits of jailing scientists are weak because besides Britain's good laboratory practice regulations, which is what put Eaton behind bars, there aren't really any laws anywhere that are made specifically to punish researchers who fake their results, regardless of the consequences. As for the men responsible for the fakery behind these photos, it doesn't look like there's been much more accountability there. The Korean government banned Huang from doing human stem cell research after the scandal broke. Emphasis on human, as he was back to regular stem cells the same year his trial began. How you ask? Well, despite his actions, Huang still had many supporters, and with their monetary donations, he was able to found the biotech company, Suam, where he still works to this day. And as for his trial, the punishment was basically negligible. The Alzheimer's conundrum is still a developing situation with few conclusions. Levine did voluntarily step down as president of Stanford earlier this year, but seemingly retains a lucrative position at the board of Regenanon Pharmaceuticals. Lesney has faced no consequences for now, although I strongly assume his institution will be distancing themselves from him once the case is wrapped up, which again doesn't sound too harsh. But there is another group who often face tougher punishments, and that's the whistleblowers who dare expose fraudulent scientists. Huang spoke out about his critics and colleagues in ways that meant that some of them had to go into hiding for months, forced to resign their jobs, and hampered in finding new ones. Elizabeth Fick and the many, many other whistleblowers who exposed manipulated research face the same consequences, which is why the majority choose to stay anonymous. It's a tough job, especially when just discovering the majority of manipulations in the first place can seem insurmountable. I mean, how can we even begin to expose researchers who make up vague but realistic values and tables, use Photoshop in ways that aren't detectable? And what about this line graph? You could literally spend two minutes to write in any numbers you want, to show whatever trend you want, without conducting any experiments. And I've also cheated more in this video than I indicated earlier. Besides removing this arrow, I also generated new parts for various portraits of people to make the aspect ratio like I wanted it. The original image from Lesney had some boxes which I removed by generating new patches. I also showed the annual review of entomology as a predatory journal earlier, which is absolutely not true. It's actually the number one entomology journal in the world, but very few of you are going to be so heavily invested in insect journals that you would notice, so I knew I could get away with it. I also rearranged the panels in the Wang image to show the ones I wanted. And you know, just for fun, I did the same for some other panels randomly. Because why not? I mean, realistically, nobody's ever gonna look for any of these manipulations. Even with the tools I've given you, it may seem hopeless to even try to discover some types of manipulations. But there are answers to these problems, and to explain them, I want to take a quick detour to the world of speedrunning. In case you're not familiar, speedrunning is where players race to complete a game as fast as possible, and massive communities have formed around it with leaderboards, passionate fans, and competition prestige that rival traditional sports, which naturally incentivizes people to cheat. And if we look at how bad companies have historically been at implementing anti-cheat measures, it could easily seem like the cheaters have won. But speedrunning communities have challenged that notion. Players submitting runs for competitive leaderboards can be required to record their controller or keyboard to see all inputs, use standardized timers and specific hardware, as well as submit raw game files. In some games, you're also required to install add-ons made by community members for cheat detection, as otherwise they won't even consider your run. Trackmania's competitive patch records all movements, so that non-human inputs like these do not sneak through the submission filters again. Potential world records are usually scrutinized more closely by analyzing submitted videos frame by frame, studying the audio for anomalies, evaluating game physics, statistics of luck, and you also have to fool the communities, which involves knowing all pro strategies, making sure you don't rise in the ranks too quickly, and can explain the logic behind all the complex decisions in a speedrun, as otherwise a top run would seem suspicious. While speedrunning is obviously not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison to scientific publishing, publishers could easily put a larger emphasis on proof. I'm not saying we should start requiring researchers to livestream their experiments, but I am saying that journals should not be accepting submissions with clearly lacking proof. And overall, a steadily increasing emphasis on just some of these factors would in all likelihood result in large changes over a few decades. In just the past two, cheat detection and speedrunning has evolved into a surprisingly sophisticated and mostly well-functioning system. 
But perhaps more importantly, it genuinely seems like these communities are doing everything they can to stop cheating. Or said more simply, they care. So why hasn't that happened with scientific publishing? Well, much of the blame for how dysfunctional it has become is often attributed to money and this guy, a notoriously hated businessman who certainly accelerated the trend. But as I see it, it would have likely happened anyhow, as monetization in science probably goes deeper than you realize. The Royal Society, home to many of the most influential scientists in history, was founded in 1660, and just over four years later, they would publish the first ever scientific journal, Philosophical Transactions. Its first issue included an improvement to optical glasses, descriptions of a spot on the belt of Jupiter, the predicted motion of a comet, and an introduction highlighting the purpose to be for the betterment of mankind. In other words, everything you'd expect of a purely scientific endeavor. And yet, their intentions were not entirely noble. After all, Philosophical Transaction was a for-profit journal. The editor and publisher, Henry Oldenburg, was allowed to pocket any profits. And while it only just about paid for its rent, the point still remains. Whether or not we like it, money has always been part of scientific publishing. And as our society has become more capitalistic, so has science. But to be clear, I'm not saying it has to be that way. The profit margins for some scientific publishers are absolutely crazy, and it certainly doesn't seem like they put enough of that towards checking the papers they publish, improving the system, or paying peer reviewers. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention that peer reviewers aren't paid? There are volunteers working for free for journals. And if, God forbid, researchers want their paper to be freely available, they often have to pay large fees. Many, many researchers are tired of and frustrated with the current state of scientific publishing, and I don't blame them. I mean, we have many of the long-term solutions right in front of us. And however complex they may be, I don't think it's too much to ask of the immensely profitable industry of scientific publishing to, for the love of science, implement them. Because it feels pretty odd that some speedrunning communities run by a handful of volunteers have more robust systems in place for identifying fraudulent submissions than even the most highly regarded organizations in science. Thank you for watching. This was part two of my series on scientific fraud. And while they've certainly been interesting to make, I'm moving on to other subjects for now. It's simply been way too draining for me as I care too much about the subject. So expect something a little more lighthearted next time we meet.